Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 4 of the subject business law Today's topic is void agreements contingent and quasi contracts. I am Dr. Rama Bansal working as assistant professor at Arya College Ludhiana. This project is sponsored by DTH Swayamprabha MHRD New Delhi. Today we are going to discuss the topics void agreements, contingent contracts and about the quasi contracts. Let's start with the first that is the void agreements. All the contracts, all the agreements may not be enforceable at law. Only those contracts which fulfill all the essentials of Indian Contract Act 1872 uh, under section 10 only those contracts are enforceable at law and except who doesn't cover all the essentials may be the void agreements now what is the void agreement a void agreement is one which is without any legal effects section 2g of indian contract act 1872 defines that an agreement not enforceable by law is said to be void that means as i said in very initial the agreement which can't be enforced at law that is a void agreement now the void agreement uh, does not create any legal rights and the liabilities as in case of valid contract there are legal liabilities there are legal rights with the parties of the contract but in case of void agreements there are no legal rights and liabilities of the parties it is void ab initio which means that any void agreement is void from the very initial startup point. For example, any contract with minor. From the very initial, this is a void agreement. So this is in law language is called as void ab initio. It is without any legal effects. Any void agreement don't have any legal enforcement it don't have any legal effects. It is not enforceable by law. Any party to the contract can't sue for the void agreements. That means the void agreements are not enforceable by law. In short, a void agreement is that agreement which is not enforceable by law. There are various types of void agreements. We will read them in the further slides. Let's start with the first one, agreements made by incompetent parties, which is covered under Section 11 of Indian Contract Act 1872. Under Section 11, all the agreements made by incompetent parties of contract are known as void agreement. What is the meaning of incompetent parties? This we have also studied in our previous lectures but for here to refer incompetent parties may include minors it may include the persons of unsound mind and it also includes the persons disqualified by law that means any person who is a minor who is of unsound mind maybe the drunkard maybe the lunatic person maybe insane so the person who are uh, of unsound mind may be permanently or of uh, or of for some duration means temporary unsoundness of the mind and the persons who are disqualified by law like enemies of the different countries or any other persons which the court says that they are disqualified to make a contract like insolvent person. So all the persons who are being declared as incompetent parties by the section 11 of Indian Contract Act if they enter into any agreement that agreement is known to be the void agreement. Next second is 
agreements made under mutual mistake of fact as we have already read in our previous lecture that any consent which is not free that means it is if it is influenced by the mistake then it is a void agreement so the mistake may be of two types mistake of law and mistake of fact we have discussed this uh, already here we are talking about mistake of fact which is covered under section 20 of indian contract act 1872 so for any agreement to be covered under this section four conditions must be fulfilled among the four conditions the first condition is there must be mistake as to the formation of contract that means when the contract is being made the formation means at the time of the formation of the contract the mistake was occurred so it deals with the formation of contract mistake of fact may be bilateral or unilateral bilateral means when both of the parties of the contract are influenced by the mistake of fact and unilateral where only one party is influenced or one party is liable for the mistake of fact that is called as unilateral mistake third is it must be about a fact essential to the agreement that means the main thing of the the main component of the agreement must be under the mutual mistake of fact it can be cleared with this uh, example the example is the parties to the agreement were not ad item on unit of measurement for sale of land ad item means they were not uh, or they, they were not having the same thing in their mind they were on uh, they were thinking something different in their minds the seller took it as canals whereas buyer took it as bigas that means when a land of uh, when a sale of land uh, contract was made agreement was made the seller was talking in terms of canals whereas the buyer was taking it that we i am buying the land in bigas that means it is uh, the mistake about the fact which is the essential to the agreement that is the land measurement of land and there th this uh, this Uh, mistaken this mistake is regarding the formation of the contract means it is very it is very initial it is very initial part of the contract where both of the parties buyer and seller are being mistaken so any contract made under mutual mistake of fact under section 20 is considered as a void agreement further as we uh, we have read about the bilateral mistake the bilateral mistakes can be regarding mistakes as to subject matter first and under the subject matter it is mistake as to existence of subject matter means when one of the party means any of the party uh, is not clear about the existence of subject matter at the time of the contract so that contract is a void contract let's take an example mr a want offers his horse to b to sale and mr mr b has uh, given his acceptance to purchase that horse for rupees 1000 but both of them never know never knew that the horse was dead at that time means the existence of the subject matter was not there the horse for which the contract was made that was dead at the time of the contract that means this is a mistake as to existence of subject matter second is mistake as to identity of subject matter that means when the when both of the parties are not uh, having the consensus ad item means they are uh, they are not clear about the identity of the subject matter then in that case also the contract is void let's take an example a wants to sell his car to b and uh, it the agreement includes the every essential of section 10 of the indian contract act that means it's a it was a valid contract but there was a mistake regarding the identity of the sub subject matter uh, like mr a was selling his white car and mr b was taking it as mr a's black car that means the identity of subject matter is not clear the buyer and the seller don't have consensus 
on the item on the subject on the identity of the subject matter so uh, here uh, the result would also remain same if the mistake is made by third party that means if someone other involved into the contract uh, have made the mistake means the party involved from the uh, purchaser side or from the seller side if had made the mistake even then the result would remain same the contract would be the agreement would be the void agreement here we can clear it with an example in this example p wrote to h inquiring the price of rifle and suggested that he may buy 50 rifles on receipt of reply from h he wired send three rifles now the telegraph clerk who is a third party now in this contract the telegraph clerk by mistake transcribed the message as send the rifles he sent 50 rifles p accepted only three and returned the rest of the rifles h filed a suit against p for non-acceptance of 47 rifles now it was held that there was no contract between the parties uh, for the 50 rifles the buyer was liable for only three rifles on account of the implied contract that means if any mistake is being made by the third party which is a uh, uh, telegraph clerk in this case even then it makes the agreement void the uh, the, tra the transaction only for three rifles is valid here and 47 rifles can't be sued third point is mistake as to the title of subject matter where the uh, the owner of the thing where the person uh, now the third is regarding the mistake as to title of subject matter. Here the mistake is on the part of the purchaser. He don't know that he is already having the title of the article which, which he or she is going to purchase. Mistake as to the price of subject matter. Any of the party may, mis may have mistaken uh, in the matter of price of the subject matter. Let's take an example. A wants to sell his mobile phone in rupees 1250, 1250, whereas the purchaser took it as 250, 250. That means there is a mistake as on the price of the subject matter. In this case, again, the contract would be a void agreement. Mistake as to the quantity of the subject matter. If there is some a mistake on the part of the quantity of the subject matter like I have mentioned in this example when I explained the title of the uh, when I when I have explained the uh, mistake of the third party there was also a mistake of quantity of subject matter mistake as to quality of subject matter if there is anything uh, which is regarding the quality of the subject matter will also make the agreement as a void agreement next we move further mistake as to possibility of performance of contract if there is any mistake to uh, if there is any mistake on the basis of possibility of performance of contract even then the contract is a void agreement the agreement is a void agreement it further includes two type of impossibilities one is a physical impossibility when it's not uh, possible to uh, perform the contract uh, physically, it is a physical impossibility. Let's see the example. A contract for hiring of a room for witnessing the coronation procession was held to be void because unknown to the parties, the procession had already been cancelled means it was not physically possible to perform it right now because the procession has already been cancelled. Second is a legal impossibility. If there is some legal impossibility uh, to perform that contract, even then it will make the agreement the void agreement. Uh, let's see the example. An agreement is void if it provides that something should be done which is legally not possible. Like for example, a person who has the land can't acquire his own land on the lease. So this is legally not possible to acquire uh, acquire his or her own land on lease. So these type of contracts if are being made, these type of agreements if being made, these are called as void agreement on the basis of the mistake of fact. 
third void agreement is agreement made in which consideration or object is unlawful where the uh, object of the uh, agreement is uh, is unlawful means that may be uh, any any consideration may be there which is forbidden by law which any special act does not allow the provisions of the act does not allow which is against the public policy which is a fraudulent act means any type of uh, um, consideration which is unlawful makes the agreement the void agreements let's take an example uh, where a hindu husband uh, wants to marry a marry another lady even though his first wife is alive so if she, if if he promises to the another woman that he would marry her so if he don't marry the other woman uh, the the other woman can can not en enforce the case reason being according to the hindu act when the first wife first legal wife is alive the hindu husband cannot marry someone else so this is against the provisions of the law so uh, so this is a uh, void agreement this agreement cannot be enforced similarly if any act is against the public policy or or similarly if any act is a fraudulent activity uh, fraudulent act so these type of uh, uh, agreements where the consideration or the object of contract is agreement is unlawful can't be sued and hence it's a void agreement next is agreement made in which consideration or object is unlawful in part it is covered under section 24 means where the whole of the contract whole of the consideration or whole of the object of the contract is not unlawful it is in part so there the court says if both of the things can be apart means if the lawful portion and the unlawful portion both can be separated so in that case the lawful portion would be enforceable and unlawful portion would be the void agreement but when this separation is not possible the contract cannot be the activities cannot be separated on the basis of lawful and unlawful consideration or object in that case whole of the contract whole of the agreement would be considered as a void agreement let's take an example if one person works for mr a works for mr b and mr b is dealing in two type of thing one is he has two type of business one is a lawful business another one is the unlawful activity and mr a is working for both uh, he is working for b and uh, uh, he, and and mr b is paying him a salary so now the salary of mr a cannot be differentiated for uh, lawful and unlawful activities here the salary salary is a whole sum of the whole business of b so in this case if b is uh, if b doesn't pay to a in that case the mr a cannot sue for the salary reason being here the consideration or the object uh, is in included in the contract is unlawful third one uh, fifth one is agreements made without consideration if any agreement where there is no consideration made that void that agreement is a void agreement uh, this is covered under section 25 a uh, section 25 also includes some exemptions where even without consideration the contracts are being treated as the valid contracts for example where there is a case of natural love and affection where there is a case of completed gifts etc but in general where there are where there is no consideration the agreement made without any consideration we considered as a void agreement next is sixth point is agreements to do the impossible act if any agreement is done under section 56 if any agreement is done with which is impossible to perform where there is a, is a zero possibility to perform that particular act that agreement is considered as the void agreement for example to match two parallel lines so where there is a, there is an agreement between two persons that mr a will pay rupees 1000 to mr b 
if mr b match the two parallel lines so there is totally this is totally impossible act the parallel lines are never to match so that means this type of agreement is a void agreement or there uh, or or there is a promise by mr a that he will find the treasure with magic so this type of things where, where which are totally impossible to perform these type of agreements are considered as void agreements next is the case of uncertain agreements what are the uncertain agreements which are uh, not certain that this would happen in future which are dependable upon a few events that means the happening or not happening of event is not certain so this is covered under section 29 so it says that when it's not possible to read the exact intention of the parties of the contract what they want to convey this is totally is uncertain agreement this the contract became uncertain on the basis of the future or as well as on the basis of ambiguity uh, ambiguity in involved in the contract uh, the uh, either party of the contract is not clear about the term they are they don't have the certainty in the terms of the contract like Uh, agreements in which price to be based on luck or an uncertain event are also void due to its uncertainty let's take an example the buyer of the horse agreed to pay rupees 1000 more if the horse proved to be lucky for him so now the horse is would be lucky for him or not would be depending upon the future event so this type of agreement held void due to its uncertainty similarly agreement to pay cash without the rate being definitely fixed we means we are entering into an agreement but we are not fixing the exact price for the transaction in prior so this type of agreement is also a void agreement for uncertainty as there is ambiguity in wording of the contract here the the price with the rate is not being fixed priorly so it is totally uncertain so because of that uh, because of lack of clarity or because of ambiguity in wording of the contract so this type of agreement is a void agreement next is agreements in restraint of marriage this is covered under section 26 if there is any agreement which is into the restraint of marriage of any person that agreement is a void agreement section 26 defines that an agreement in restraint of marriage of any person other than a minor is void so any agreement because because law says that if there is any agreement which is restraining a person not to marry so this is against the public policy this is contrary to public policy so these type of agreements are not acceptable in the law but in english law a partial restraint on marriage is allowed if it is found reasonable Uh, there is a case of rani uh, rao rani versus gulab rani which clears this case the two widows agreed that if either of them remarried she would forfeit her share in the property the allahabad high court held that the said restraint on marriage was not a direct prohibition on remarry so hence the contract is not a void agreement that means when there is a direct restraint on the marriage of any person then and this is considered to be against the public policy hence the contract the agreement is treated as void agreement next is agreements in restraint of trade similarly as in case of agreements in restraint of marriage the agreements in restraint of trade are considered as void agreements under section 27 section 27 lays down that an agreement seeking to restrain a person from exercising a lawful profession trade or business of any kind is void to that extent that means uh, where there is a restraint on a person that means he can't go with he can't exercise his uh, his rights for lawful profession lawful trade or lawful business if anyone is restraining any person to do this to this lawful profession trade or business so these type of agreements are considered as void agreements under section 27 however 
the partial restraint or a restraint confined to a limited space and time is valid and enforceable this uh, this point that the partial restraint is valid and enforceable is valid is right in case of gujarat bottling company limited versus coca cola company uh, what happened in this case in this case on 30th april 1994 coca cola company entered into an agreement with gujarat bottling company whereby coca cola granted to gujarat bottling company a non exclusive license to use the trademarks like uh, uh, gold spot limca thumbs up maza etc uh, in relation to goods prepared for uh, concentrates supplied by coca cola company the agreement was subject to a condition that the franchisee uh, shall not deal with the uh, competitive goods uh, it was held that a condition with the franchises cannot be considered as agreement in restraint of trade the same thing was explained in the another case madhav chandra and raj kumar das where the defendant felt uh, affected by the business of the plaintiff and agreed to pay a sum of money to the plaintiff uh, held he uh, held he uh, stopped his business in that particular locality the plaintiff stopped his business but the defendant did not pay him the plaintiff sued uh, sued the defendant to recover the said amount the calcutta high court held that the agreement was the void agreement hence therefore no part of it can be enforced that means where there are the agreements in restraint of trade fully that are totally void but a partial restraint or a restraint confined to a limited space or limited time is valid and enforceable there are few exceptions to agreements in restraint of trade under section 27 among those exceptions the first exception is as the statutory exceptions statutory exceptions are those exceptions which are implied by the law by the provisions of the law among the statutory exception the first one is sale of goodwill if any company sells its goodwill to another company so in that case it can put some restraint that they would not sell their product they would not sell their uh, sell their product in a said locality or or near locality or a, or for a specified time period because there is a sale of goodwill of that company because the 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 company who has purchased that product Uh, is a beneficiary here so in the, so the so it is in the benefit of the beneficiary company that the other company should not uh, should not continue with the same kind of uh, product with, uh, uh, or with the same kind of business there second is under the partnership act 1932 under the partnership act 1932 there are some agreements in restraint of trade which are valid first one is partners competing business if there are more than 2 3 uh, if if there are if there are 2 3 4 partners in a partnership firm so they can have a uh, an agreement that that any of the partner while remaining in the partnership would not continue with the same type of business if this type of agreement is done this is a valid agreement rights of outgoing partner under section 36 of partnership act 1932 this define that any outgoing partner would not continue with the same business up to a specified period of time or into a locality nearby next is partner similar business on dissolution sometimes it is being uh, agreed that on the dissolution of the partnership business uh, any of the partner or a few of the partners would not continue with the same business reason being the other who is authorized to do may get affected so this type of agreement is a valid agreement next a agreement in restraint of trade a partner upon the sale of the goodwill of the firm may take the promise may take the may sign an agreement with the other person that he would not continue with the same kind of trade in a said locality or in said time period so these if, if these type of agreements are made these are the valid agreements next exceptions under the common law the first is the service agreement 
if any person who is into the service who is performing his services on the remuneration basis if any agreement if any restraint is being imposed on that otherwise this is a void but in few cases this is a valid let's see agreement which binds employee during the time of his agreement not to carry similar business or accepting other employment is a valid agreement reason being a person is working with someone working with some employer so at the same time he cannot start with the same time of his own business if he do so if and if there is a contract if there is an agreement contrary to this so this type of agreement is a valid agreement and can be enforced this is clear in case of charles versus mcdonald the facts of the case are that a agreed to become assistant for 3 years of b who was a doctor practicing at some place so it was agreed that during the term of that agreement a was not to practice on his own account in the similar area in the same area at the end of uh, at the end of the one, uh, at the end of the year a ceased to be act as b's assistant and began to practicing his own in the same area so it was held that the agreement was a valid agreement and a could be restrained by an injunction from doing so so this is clear from this that if there is any agreement uh, regarding this uh, re regarding continuing with the same type of services with the same type of business so that can be restrained but in case of second point like uh, once the services are terminated so such kind of restraint it void like in like in previous case charles versus mcdonald if this the, if the duration was of 3 years and if mr b is practicing his own after 3 years this would be a valid restraint in the next point when the when there is a restraint after the termination of services this type of restraint is a uh, is a void is a void restraint it is a, it is covered under the void agreement like in the previous case if the duration period of agreement was 3 years and after the period of 3 years if b continues it is a valid one but because he has started within the within the 3 within the agreement period of 3 years this is a valid restriction and it can be enforced uh, third one is when the restraint is regarding to protect employer's secrets so that type of restraint is a, a valid restraint that can be made let's take an example if a lady of a saloon of of beauty saloon of beauty parlor restrain her employees to continue with the same type of business uh, in the near locality or in the next 12 months or next 6 months any any fixed period so this type of restraint is counted as a valid restraint next is a trade combinations if there are a few trade combinations uh, in restraint of trade so they are counted as a valid restraint that can be enforced basically these type of agreements are made to maintain a price level and to avoid the underselling of goods uh, that 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 are not illegal that are legal so agreements between the manufacturers that not to sell their goods before below a certain price uh, to earn the profits to divide the profits perfectly so these type of restraints are counted as the valid constraints but the main crux is that when these type of restraints are made the the purpose should be the mutual benefit but if any restraint leads to any kind of monopoly so these restraints are not valid restraints and cannot be enforced as it it is clear from the case of uh, english hop growers versus daring in this case an association of hop growers enter uh, enter into an agreement to sell the hop uh, through the regulated rates the defendant who was hop grower agreed to give his crop to the association for selling at the controlled price restrictions imposed on the defendant's right to sell his crop was found reasonable so that means if any kind of restriction is made which is in the mutual benefit of the uh, of the imposers upon uh, of the manufacturers of the sellers so such type of restraints are considered as the valid constraints next 
is the agreement in restraint of legal proceedings covered by section 28 section 28 states that every agreement by which a party is restrained absolutely from enforcing his right under contract by legal proceedings in the ordinary tribunals or which limits the time within which he can enforce his right is void for example where a servant agrees not to sue for wrongful dismissal is void means where such type of agreement is taken by the servant that if something even wrongful is being done means if he is being dismissed wrongfully even though he can't sue this into the court this type of agreement is against the legal proceedings and is counted as a void agreement an agreement restricting the right of either party to sue in a particular court even is counted as a valid uh, valid constraint valid restraint and if it is printed in the invoices for example uh, if a is appointing to b and he, and he is mentioning in his appointment letter that any um, any kind of uh, if, if if any kind of declarity is there or any kind of problem is there into the contract the contract can only be sued in the jurisdiction of punjab so if this type of restriction is made this type of restraint is being made this is considered as a valid restraint last is the uh, wagering agreements what are the wagering agreements which are covered under section 30 basically the word wager means uh, basically it, it's a bet uh, though that means section 30 defines that agreements by way of wager are totally void no suit will lie for recovering anything alleged to be won or any wager or entrusted to any person to abide by results of any game or other uncertain event on which any wager is made even ensign's law of contract define wager as a promise to give money or money's worth upon the determination or ascertainment of an uncertain event so that means if any promise is being made or which is dependent upon the ascertainment of an uncertain event that is called a wagering contract wagering agreement under section 30 and these wagering agreements are totally void what are the essentials of a wagering agreements means when we say that this agreement is covered under section 30 of 30 regarding the wagering agreement the first one is the agreement must be dependent upon uncertain event if any agreement is dependent upon the uncertain event for example uh, mr a says i will pay you rupees 100 if it rains today so if it rains today is totally a uh, totally an uncertain event the rain may or may not be there so that means the agreement is totally dependent upon an uncertain event and uncertainty is not known to uh, and, and certainty of the rain in this example is not known to any party. So that is uh, that agreement can be considered as an wagering agreement. There must be mutual chances of gain or loss. Both of the parties have same chances to, uh, to, to gain it or to lose it the parties must not have any interest in the event except for stake except the money or money's worth involved into an agreement they the either of the party don't have any interest in that particular agreement means if they have bet for rupees 100 uh, the both of the parties have bet for rupees 100 so uh, except that 100 rupees there is no other interest involved in that agreement the parties must not have any control over the events both of the parties should not have any control they are out of control of both of the parties as i have taken the example of rain so rain is not into the control of mr a as well as of mr b next is the promise must be to pay money or money's worth there must be something uh, as a consideration involved into that contract that may be money or any money's worth promise must be conditional on an event happening or not happening that means promise is depending upon happening of an event or 
not happening of an event there must be uncertainty and last is there must be two parties and each party must stand to win or lose means there must be two parties to a contract one for a, a one as a promiser second as a promisee so if the if all the essentials are included in any agreement that agreement would be counted as a agreement of wagering so there are uh, there are few agreements which are exceptions to the wagering agreements for example horse racing in the horse racing competitions and the skill competitions all the wagering agreements are the void agreements but in case of horse racing competition or any skill competition these agreements are not the void agreements these are treated as the valid contracts let's take an example an agreement to contribute towards a prize or a sum of money value of rupees 500 or above to be awarded to the winner of horse race is a valid contract so what are the effects of wagering agreements so there are two type of transactions in the wagering agreements one are the main transactions second one are the collateral transactions so in the case of main transactions if there is a wagering agreement the main transactions involved would amount to the void agreements and in case of the collateral transactions uh the effect of uh, transactions collateral to wager are all agreements by way of wager are void but wagering contracts are not are only void they are not illegal but in india in maharashtra and in gujarat the wagering agreements are counted as illegal agreements so uh, uh, if we talk about any transaction collateral to wager so that can be enforced the main transaction is the void but the collateral transaction can be enforced let's take an example if a lends money to b to pay off a gambling debt so there is a transaction collateral to wagering so here a can recover the money from b it would be a valid contract so next we come to the commercial transactions and wagers an agreement for actual purchase and sale of any commodity is not a wagering agreement but sometimes it becomes difficult to determine whether a particular transaction was in fact a contract of purchase and sale or a wagering a contract for the payment of differences let's take an example if two traders a and b contract for the sale and purchase of 100 bags of sugar to be delivered 3 months after as rupees 400 per bag it may be difficult to say whether it's a perfectly uh, perfectly good commercial contract entered into the intention of uh, enter into the enter into with the intention of delivering the goods or whether the two traders are really speculating and wagering upon the prices of the sugar so these type of transactions if only one of the parties to the agreement uh, had the intention that the agreement should be for mere payment of differences and the other party was not aware of that fact then the agreement is enforceable otherwise if both parties have intention that this this was uh, this contract this agreement was done with the intention of uh, uh, wagering only with the intention of speculation only then this agreement would be a void agreement so this was about the uh, void agreements which are uh, which are not enforceable at law now we come to the next category that is the contingent contracts what are the contingent contracts section 31 defines that a contingent contract is a contract to do or not to do something is some event collateral to such contract does or does not happen in other words in simple words the contract in which the promiser undertakes to perform the contract only on the happening or non happening of some future uncertain event uh, this may be uh, confused with the wagering type of contracts but there is a clear line of demarcation between two which i will explain in my further slides uh, what are the contingent contracts let's clear it by the way uh, with the help of example a contracts to pay b rupees 10000 if b's house is burnt so this is purely a contingent contract which is dependent upon the happening or not happening of any event in the future 
all insurance contracts except the life insurance all contracts of guarantee or indemnity are contingent contracts reason being they are dependent upon the happening or not happening of certain events in the future so what are the various essentials of a valid contingent contracts let's see them all one is first is there must be a valid contract means the all the essentials of a valid contract under section 10 must be present into a contingent contract the performance of the contract must be conditional that means the performance of the contract uh, should be like this that a particular condition if gets fulfilled only then the contract would be performed the event must be uncertain and depending upon happening or not happening in future of a uncertain event means the event of the the uh, the event of the contract must be totally depending upon the happening or not happening of a future uncertain event as i have explained in the previous example mr a will pay to mr b if if mr b's house is burned that means mr b's house jo uh, that is depending the the payment of rupees 1000 is depending upon the happening of the fire to mr b's house the event must be collateral to the contract there must be a contract to do or not to do something the contract must be to do i will pay this is a contract of doing i would not pay if mr b's house is burnt so that means the contract may be to do or not to do something the event may be an act of the party the event should not be at the discretion of the promiser means promiser should not play uh, any role in the happening of that event so if all these conditions are being fulfilled that means that is a valid contingent contract rules regarding enforcement of contingent contract means when a contingent contract can be enforced one depends upon the happening of future certain uncertain event if the event is depending upon some future uncertain event that is covered under section 32 if this is being the, the, if this is the case this can be enforced uh, that means the enforcement of the contingent contract is totally depending upon the happening of a certain event let's see the example a makes a contract with b to buy b's house if a survives c so this contract cannot be enforced by law unless and until c dies in a's lifetime that means the 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 contract is based upon unless and until c dies in a's lifetime so that means there the contract the contingent contract is depending upon a happening of a future uncertain event death is totally uncertain event so this so this type if if this type of thing is there it can be uh, it is a contingent contract and can be enforced impossibility of performance make the contract void if like in this example a would die this is certain that means it is it is possible to perform the contract but if some kind of impossibility is involved into the contract it would make the contract void let's take an example a contracts to b uh, to pay b a sum of money when me when b marries c c dies without being married to b because now c has died so it's totally impossible to perform the contract so this contract will become void this cannot be enforced that means till when there is a there is a, a, a there is a chance to perform the contract in future this can be enforced but when uh, once the, the it, it becomes impossible to perform the task in future it is totally void next contingent contracts to do or not to do anything if an uncertain event does not happen means if any event does not happen can be enforced but when the happening of that events become impossible and not before covered under section 33 let's see the example for it a agrees to pay b a sum of money if a certain ship does not return the ship is sunk the contract cannot be enforced after the ship sinks because the return of the ship is no longer possible next is it is the way in which a person will act at an unspecified 
time covered under section 34 that means if a specified time is being provided and the other party does not perform in that specified period of time it loses its enforceability let's see the example a agrees to pay b a sum of money if b marries c but c marries d the marriage of b to c is impossible now therefore the contract is discharged Next is depends upon the happening of specified uncertain event with fixed time period covered under section 35. So there is an example that is if A promises to pay B a sum of money if a certain ship returns in a year. The contract may be enforced if a ship returns within a year. That means there is a fixed time period when the ship returns the contract can be enforced. Next is when uh, it depends upon the non-happening of specified uncertain event with fixed time period. Also covered under section 35, a promise A promises to pay B a sum of money if a certain ship returns in a year. But if the ship does not return in a year, the contract can be enforced. Means the contract is depending upon contingent contract may be depending upon happening of the certain event and non-happening of certain event with the fixed time period. It depends upon impossible event covered under section 36. This section is based on the principle that the persons cannot contract to do impossible things or make their contracts depend upon the happening of an impossible event. Means there is the, it is impossible to perform. This is not an enforceable contract. Let's see the example. A agrees to pay rupees 1000 if B will marry A's daughter C. And C was dead at the time of agreement. Means it was totally impossible to perform the contract as the C was dead when the contract was made. So this agreement is void. Second example is A agrees to pay B rupees 1000 if two straight lines should enclose a space and this type of agreement is reason being is impossible to perform so it held void. So now as I told earlier there is a there is a clear demarcation between the uh, contingent contracts and the wagering agreements they seems to be the same so it's very important to know that what are the lines of the difference between the both that is contingent contracts as well as the wagering agreements see the first point contingent contracts are valid and enforceable whereas wagering agreements are initially void and cannot be enforced. Second point of difference is in case of contingent contracts parties are interested in subject matter of the contract whereas in case of wagering agreements parties have no interest in subject matter of the agreement. In case of contingent contracts future uncertain event is collateral or incidental and in case of wagering uncertain event is the determining factor that means uh, in case of wagering agreements, the total thing, the total thing is depending upon the uncertainty of the event and that is only the determining factor of win or lose. The next uh, difference is in case of contingent contracts, there may not be reciprocal promises, but they are very much uh, present in case of wagering agreements. In case of contingent contracts, all contingent contracts are not of wagering nature. But all the wagering agreements are of contingent contracts. So, so, so these points clearly explains that there is a difference between the contingent contracts and the wagering agreements. Next we come to the last component of this lecture that is the quasi contracts. What are quasi contracts? An agreement between the parties is essential for a valid contract. But under certain circumstances, various obligations may arise without any agreement between the parties. Such obligations are implied in the conduct of parties and such obligations are called the quasi-contracts. The base of this uh, definition is the basis of obligation is that no one should have unjust benefit at the cost of the another. And second is these type of obligations are also known as implied or the constructive contracts. 
the best example of the quasi contract is the founder of loss goods as there was no uh, contract in between in, in in between the parties such obligation such contract is being implied with the conduct of the parties so these type of contracts are enforceable and are called as quasi contracts so there are various types of quasi contracts which are covered under section 68 to 72 of indian contract act 1872 so first of them is the claim for necessary supplied so uh, section 68 says that if the uh, if the necessaries are supplied to a person who are incompetent to contract for example the minor in that case for that necessaries a person can be held liable but the what are the necessaries necessaries are those things with, uh, without which an individual cannot reasonably exist means that are very much important for living of any person but the thing to uh, be considered here that the person to whom the person uh, who is incompetent to contract uh, if is being supplied with the necessaries then the remedy is not personal the remedy is only against the estate of the uh, party which is incompetent to contract to whom the necessaries are being supplied next is obligation is to pay only the reasonable amount not the exact amount of the necessaries only the reasonable amount can be charged from the person who is incompetent to contract and to whom the necessaries are being supplied for example a supplies to b a lunatic with necessary suitable to his condition in life so here a is entitled to be reimbursed from the property of the b but only up to a reasonable price not the exact value of the necessaries second is reimbursement of payment under section 69 if any payment is being made by any of the party under the quasi contract that may be reimbursed the person is uh, is bound by law to pay that money to the other party but the, that another person must be interested in payment of that money and the other party must have aid the money because of such interest this ca this can be uh, more clear with the example given below uh, b holds a land granted by a the zamindar on lease so b is responsible for uh, paying all the revenues to the government but for a year b doesn't pay and to uh, and to recover all the land revenues um, uh, this land is being advertised for sale by the government so b because he was interested in the land wants to prevent the land and he pays to the government the all the land revenues so here b is not enti entitled for reimbursement of the uh, of the payment reason being he was legally bound to pay that money next is it's not gracious act Se uh, section 70 says that the person must lawfully do something for another person or deliver something to him or her it is it is it is lawfully imposed on the person to deliver something to the another person the person must have done uh, the 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 another person must have intended to act graciously and the other person must voluntarily accept the acts or goods and must have enjoyed its benefits involved and this can be uh, better understood with the case of the mother mudlair versus a secretary of state of a uh, state for india in this case what happened the government carried out repairs to an irrigation tank owned by the government jointly with the zamindar and uh, uh, and sued uh, the zamindar for the contribution of the uh, of the expenses incurred for the repairs so it was held that government in carrying out the repairs had acted lawfully and had not intended to carry item uh, uh, to to carry the repairs to carry them out graciously and that the zamindar who enjoyed the benefits of repair was liable to pay the compensation again in this case if some money is paid by mistake or something is delivered by mistake that is the uh, that is the responsibility of the other party to refund it 
लेट्स टेक एन एग्जाम्पल इफ द पेमेंट मेड टू वर्ड्स टैक्स और ड्यूटी विदाउट अथॉरिटी ऑफ लॉ इज मेड बाय मिस्टेक so same is to be refunded by the government that is the responsibility of the other party to return it which is being paid by mistake next is the responsibility of finder of goods lost goods that is covered under section 71 so the finder of lost goods have the same kind of responsibilities which are the responsibilities of a bailee he cannot appropriate the goods without taking proper steps to find out the owner Uh, he has to retain the goods until he receives the compensation he is bound to take care of goods he has the duty not to mix the goods with his own goods and there is a legal obligation on the finder of goods to return the goods and again the finder of lost goods is entitled to the possession of goods as against the whole world except the true owner he can possess the goods uh, uh, he can possess the goods against the a whole word let's take an example h found a diamond in the shop and handed over it to the shop owner f to keep till the true owner is found in the meantime h has made his whole efforts to find the true owner and after some time h tendered f for lawful expenses incurred by him for finding the true owner and asked him to hand over the diamond f refused so it was held that f must return the diamond to h because h has the right to possess the goods against the whole world except the true owner of the diamond next point is payment or delivery of goods by mistake or under coercion under section 72 Section seventy two says if any of the goods are being delivered by mistake to anyone or under coercion, that must be returned. It is clear from the example A and B jointly owed rupees thousand to C. A alone paid the amount to C and B, not knowing the fact, also paid rupees thousand to C. So in this case, because the total amount due was rupees thousand and that is being paid by A. and b was unaware of the fact and he has also paid the money so c is bound to repay the amount to b who has paid it by mistake so this type of uh, contract is enforceable so mistakes must be as to the existence of application not merely as to some collateral matter and which is clearly explained in the case of sales tax officer versus kanhaiya lal mukand lal sarad what happened in this case uh, a certain amount of sales tax was paid uh, by a firm to the up sales tax law on the on on some certain transactions subsequently the court the the court held that the that is such the, uh, that the levy of sale tax on such transaction is ultra virus so that means it was held that that money which was paid by kanaiya lal mukandla sarad uh, is to be returned to them so uh, by now we have discussed the three things which was the void agreement there are few sections which cover the various agreements into the cat category of the void agreements contingent contracts and in the contingent contracts we have also uh, differentiated wagering agreements with the contingent contracts and in last we have covered the quasi contracts and the various types of contract uh, quasi contracts covered under indian uh, in, covered under indian contract act 1872 so this is the end of lecture thank you so much